No. Sure. Because the, the, these are like. Is it actually gone? Okay. For a solution versus piecemeal. So I guess we can talk a little bit about Ansible. Well, I wanted to start with like what everybody's experience is <coughs> in automating, so we know kind of where everybody's at. Um, I went through a couple of different ways to like start this talk. Um, I was trying to think of, of course, this is not going to work. So why do we why do we automate things? Because humans are bad at information technology. Who in here thinks they're good at IT? <laughs> You're not. Uh, humans make mistakes, and the reason that you automate it is because to be human is to make mistakes. It, it is to be flawed. Um, that's what makes us bad at IT. So why do so we, we should I, face do we humans out things? immediately? Because we humans are out. bad at information technology. Who in here um, thinks they're good at IT? We really should be focused on beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. Because uh, we, humans make mistakes, out being and the very reason that you want to result it in a lot of to be human is journey, journey, but if you want to it is an application or um, thing that's what makes it bad building. So why so do we need to find more because uh, humans are any sort of scale information technology. Um, behind Who in here thinks they're good at IT? We really should be focused on You're not. Uh, all humans make me start out being and very interested that you in the reason that you to be human is to be but if you want to be, it is to just need to be able to do um, it. Thing that's what widgets are building. So why so do we need to find more? Because, because uh, humans are bad. So, uh, what do we use for? Uh, for uh, who do you think is there? Think they're they're good good we really should be so focused. You're not. Humans make me start out being the very reason that you want to be. And most often we start with resistance to automation. People will say, oh, I already use Puppet or Chef. Oh, I already put all those things in Bash. Or I'm really lazy and I just don't want to do that because it's a lot of work. It's easier for me to point and click a couple of times because I don't really do it that often. And, uh, and, and you have to change your thought process. That it doesn't matter how often you do it. What matters is the results. How consistent are the results of whatever it is that you're doing? So. The purpose in automating is to make you less relevant. I, I didn't even get a smile. <laughs> um, so seriously, uh, automation is not a new concept. How many people in here are familiar with Bash? You uh, written something in PowerShell. Automation is not new. This isn't a new idea, but the tooling that's available out there is. Um, if you're using Puppet or Chef for automation, you're using the wrong tool because those are configuration management tools and configuration management and general purpose automation are inherently different because general purpose automation is targeted at all the things it's not just managing the configuration of a dam which Puppet and Chef are extremely good at doing Puppet's probably uh, the best technology out there for it's been around for yeah it's very mature um, and and it's very good at what it does, which is configuration management. It can do some automation, but they're just not the best tool out there. Um, Ansible's probably the best tool out there. Why you automate, the real reason that you automate, uh, I was making, I was kind of making fun of all the, uh, all the things, all the, all the things I've heard people say over the years when talking about why they don't want to automate or why it's not worth their time or why they're not willing to just dive in and, and get it done. Um, it's really about freeing your time for something more important to do. Uh, do you really want to click next, next, finish on every single application that you install or yum install X, Y, or Z or download an executable from the internet and install it on Windows? Do you really want to go through that every single time you set it up? And most people would say, well, I don't really do it that often. It's like, well, stop. That's not the point. The point is the result. How did you get there? How did you get a hold of software? How did you install it? What process did you go through? That determines the results, because that's all that really matters. Um, so automation can help you free up your time to do something more important, because there's always something more important to do than click next, next, finish. Um, a lot of organizations, or even home labs, like my home lab has accrued a significant amount of technical debt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Automating things can help free you of that technical debt that your organization or uh, your environment has accrued. And, and technical debt is accrued over time. It's, it's something that builds up. That like, 
oh well my process to getting this exchange server is is I click next next finish on the Windows OS and then I click next next finish on SQL Server and then I click next next finish on uh, Exchange and then I go through the Exchange setup process and there's a guy that does that. He may not do it all that often, um, but it is a technical debt that you have accrued by going through all those steps and not automating any parts of those process. Because uh, when it goes down, you, know, you gotta pay for that again. You gotta pay for that guy's time, that person's time, again. I'm just thinking about saving all my clicks and all the hotkeys. Yeah. You know, it, you, you gotta you gotta find the fastest, most repeatable way to do things. It's more about repeatability than it is speed. Um, automation's not meant to be fast. It's supposed to be it's supposed to provide you with consistent results. So, also, how do you introduce new technologies into your environment? How do you get a hold of new technologies? Well, the answer is you stop worrying about all the stuff you've already done because it's already automated. It's already complete. You don't have to worry about how you got there. You can start building on top of, of what you already have because you know that if it blows up, you can just push the button and reprovision the whole thing. And that's wildly valuable because you can stop worrying about your, like your metal layer and your operating system layer and your database layer. And you know, IT systems are made up of many, many, many layers. And when all of them are automated, it allows you to iterate and move forward. With, with what you're bringing to market or the services you're providing your, yourself at your house or whatever it is that you're passionate about. Um, the technology, it allows you to innovate because you can stop worrying about all the other stuff. Like, oh, well, if this blows up, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna have to build all these things again. Well, if it was automated, then you wouldn't. So why do we choose Ansible for automation? Um, because I don't hit myself. <laughs> Ansible is extremely easy to learn. There's not, uh, you know, there's a learning curve even uh, even with Bash. There's a learning curve associated with Bash. The playbook and, does seem much more simple compared uh, to Puppet and some of those other. If you're, yeah, I mean, if you're a computer scientist, then yeah. Puppet seems really simple. It's like, oh yeah, this makes sense to me. Well, that function does this thing. It's like, ow, whoa, whoa, <laughs> what are you talking about right now? No, I want this to be. This was supposed to be easy. Uh, and that, that's why the, those tools are really great at configuration management because you have a fine-grained control where you, something doesn't work right. We just write a function to make it, it work right. right. Yeah, hey, you make it work right. Um, where with Ansible, it's the barrier to entry is like, I, I couldn't get my wife to do it. She doesn't know anything about technology at all. But I could get maybe my mom, who is a computer teacher in a school who barely knows Linux. She could maybe do it. It's not hard. Um, and I don't hate myself. The other thing that's important with automation is unless you're working uh, in a shop where there's one guy or one person, then you might have to explain what happens to somebody else. And being able to show them the code that you have written, be like, oh, well, this thing does that. Uh, that's really, really, really important because it keeps the organization from having a hero. If you're familiar with the term hero, it means that there's always that one guy that like, he does all the things, he knows all the things because he's scripted or automated or, or done all these things, but he's a, the only person in that organization that knows how to do those things. And if they get hit by a truck or quit their job, uh, you are screwed. Um, so Ansible's great because other human beings could understand it. You know, None of us in here are robots yet. Uh, the other thing with Ansible is because it is so easy to read, it's possible you could get somebody else to collaborate and help you write these things. And how many people have ever written a script and you hand it off to somebody else and they're like, I don't, I don't understand any of this. I couldn't help you. If I wanted to help you, I would love to help you with this, but I don't know what this thing is doing. Um, and Ansible is human readable, so you don't have that problem. Um, it's self-documenting code and people are encouraged to write like, what is this function? What does this piece of automation do? And it's line by line, task by task. So if something's really complex, somebody can just read the playbook. And it's almost see. like this enforced culture angle to it. Yeah. To make people document their code. And make people document how simple this stuff really is to set up. Like technology is not that hard if you, if you build on it and iterate. Um, we all want to do as little work as humanly possible. How many people in here want to take the hardest way humanly possible to an objective? 
<laughs> that's often what we end up doing <laughs> just because that's not what we want. I mean, that's, that's a lot of the times that's where we end up. <laughs> we end up taking the hardest road, the hardest, bumpiest road possible. But really, that's not what we want. We want the lowest barrier to entry. We want the easiest possible solution because we want even the simplest of people to be able to understand it. Um, and then the most important thing about why Ansible, and this really is the most important thing, is the vendor ecosystem is incredible in Ansible. If you are a vendor that's making a product, say a firewall, or a router, or an application, or a, a widget that does a thing, if you write an Ansible module for it, well, you can lower the barrier to entry for understanding how uh, how we get this service up, how do I make this thing work. So I can build an incredibly complex application and then an automation module that makes it consumable for everybody else. And the vendor ecosystem in Ansible is just, how many modules are there now? There's thousands, like two, two three thousand modules. I mean, like, you're, if, you're, if you're a technology company, you don't have an Ansible module at this point. It's like, what are you doing? So, so that's the question I have. So a lot yeah. of languages are like that, where the language, the computer language itself is fairly simple, mm -hmm. but there's this gigantic library of stuff and functions and things that you can draw on. So is it complex to understand the vendor modules and how they work? Does it all follow the same model? What's the, what, what, what's the learning curve on that? I would say the learning curve, I mean, that's that, it's not really vendor by vendor, because Ansible has some pretty decent standards as far as like what does a module look like how does a module get into the repo how is it documented because like the coolest code in the world the coolest technology in the world if it's not documented is totally useless um, except for the guy who wrote it so the documentation that comes along with an Ansible module at least explains and gives you an example of what you could do like if you go look at the um, you go into the cloud modules and look at like Proxmox or something like that. It's like that's pretty obscure, um, but there's a module for it, and it also explains to you how to do the thing that you're looking to do. Like, the, what will this module do? Well, they documented all of it, uh, and that's really, 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 really important because what you're trying to do is make your life as easy as humanly possible because you don't hate yourself. So, Ansible's documentation is incredible as well. They've got a good ecosystem there. And every vendor, I mean, there's like there's some there's some um, um, companies out there that are using Ansible right now that mandate if you want to have technology in their organization, you will write an Ansible module. It won't exist here. Um, and I want to say one of them's pretty big. So, so when you're using Ansible, you out of those two thousand modules, is there like a smaller set you just consistently use most of the time? Me, I use OpenStack modules because I'm OpenStack guy. Like I use those modules like it's going out of style because well, I don't. even before, like before you went to the college, stuff, like, was there just a set you were? the most common core things you do? Or? No, I mean, because I have, a, well, I mean, I have a wheel, I have a bad, I'm a bad example, because I got a lot of wheels turning, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever use anything for any other, for any term of time other than the OpenStack module. Um, and Ansible also uh, has this amazing ecosystem of playbooks that you can download called Ansible Galaxy, that not only do you not have to write the module yourself, for how to interact with the technology, whatever that technology is, so, you know, say AWS. Maybe I don't, I don't want to learn how AWS's APIs work. Well, I don't have to, so I can just go use an Ansible module for that. Not only do I not have to learn how the modules work, I also do have to, to learn how the playbooks work. Uh, somebody already wrote those for me too in Ansible Galaxy. If you go check out Ansible Galaxy, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people's playbooks that they have already written for you too. It can't get any easier. This one, I want to do as little work as humanly possible. Not only do I not want to write the automation module myself like a bash script, that's, that's, those are one and the same. Um, I also don't want to write like how I interact with it. I just want to hand it my variables and go. Like, next. Um, do people use Galaxy? I think there's a lot of people using Galaxy. I just built it up and it's like 40,000 users. There's, uh, yeah, there's 80,000 Ubuntu uh, Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu things in, in Galaxy. Yeah, I mean, and these are pre-written playbooks, so yeah. you don't even know have to know how to write a complex playbook because there are thousands and thousands of examples already written for you. Like, how do you spin up MariaDB and, and get a database on it? Well, there's probably already, there's already a module for it, and there's also a playbook that already does all that stuff for you, too. It can't get much easier.
Um, so that's really the why. Why do we choose Ansible? Why not Bash? Why not Ruby? Why not Python? Why not Chef or Puppet? This is why, because of the ecosystem that is around it. Uh, and the barrier to entry is extremely low. Um, how do we uh, how do we get started in Ansible? Well, first you need to make a plan. Like, okay, well, this is the very first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to start small with one step. Let's say I want to, I have an installed operating system and I want to set up whatever that server is. Let's say it's a database. I'm gonna start by setting up the database. And then I'm gonna load the database with, I'm gonna populate it with data. Uh, start there, you make a plan and Ansible is done step by step. It's one, one, two, three, four, five. That's that's how Ansible works. That's how you write your automation. Um, maybe set up a test environment to start uh, uh, automating this code against. But the most important thing to know in Ansible is keep it in source control. Keep your code in source control. I'll say it again. Keep your code in source control because uh, when it breaks, if you break it, then you can go back. If you save everything in a generic text file on your file system, well, it's not tracked. Changes aren't tracked, and you can't go back. So How let's say you integrate you, Ansible with a Git repository. Then it sounds like that's yes, sort of you want, yeah, you could use that. Okay. Whatever source control. I don't like that. I don't want to purposely call out Git, but it's probably the best source control system out there right now. But if you want to use uh, Subversion or or what's but it does called? integrate with those other things. So it does integrate with Git and Subversion. When you say integrate, yeah. you mean I will store my Ansible code in Git? No, no. <laughs> I mean it can pull the source. It can pull the code from a repository. It can talk to a Git repository. And if pull. you want that to be your first task, I would make that my first task. <laughs> Just a question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, it's yeah. general purpose automation. So if you think so, then about you take like, your you take your source code, say whatever your your most current your current production mm -hmm. version of you put that someplace else that then Ansible pulls from to deploy from. Yeah, I mean, it's just okay. a way to make sure that your code is is version controlled. That's really important in in the oh. automation spectrum. Like, if you want your first step to be pull from this Git repo and then run the playbook that are inside of that, that's actually probably a really good process to go through. And I'm gonna show you a tool that does that part for you. Um, so, but it's very important that you keep things in source control because like you, you write playbooks three or four years ago, you're not gonna remember how it worked or what you did or why you did it. So it's really important to keep it in source control because if you change that thing two years into it and it breaks, you want people to go back. And that's, that's, that's pretty much the most important thing. Um, once you're working with Ansible. And then you write code. That's, that's pretty much how it works. So, uh, could anybody tell me what this, this is an Ansible task. This is what an Ansible task looks like. Um, what's it doing? Anybody, anybody tell me? It's doing a computer uh, blinky blink, a yum install of HTTPD and PHP with SQL. Yeah, and PHP and MySQL, which obviously that's facing that much up so bad. But, oh, it's failing. It's like a lamp. I got I got I got I forgot the white space on this one. It's See, this, now this playbook is going to fail. It's I showed you a bad example. <laughs> 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 I can't even write this code right. That's hilarious. So yeah, I mean, this this is an Ansible task uh, that has a loop included in it. I mean, how many people have written a loop in Ruby or Python or you know, it's not that complicated, but this is a lot less complicated. I could hand this to somebody who's not super technical, and they could probably figure it out. Like, what were you doing here? Well, I was installing Apache, PHP, and PHP MySQL. Like, that's simple. This is, this is the basic building block of Ansible. This is a task. Everything in Ansible is a task. That's where you start, is I have one thing that I want to do. And then I take those one, that one thing and combine it with another thing, and combine it with another thing before you know, I have an entire application from soup to nuts, fully automated. And you start with one task, small, small bytes, small bytes. And that will be a playbook? This is not a playbook, we'll get to a playbook. This is a task. Okay. So I'm going through the Ansible vernacular right now because you're gonna hear a lot of words and you could put these things together however you want to. Um, if you want a file that's just got uh, 100,000 tasks in it, you can do that. You can, you, Ansible is flexible. It will, it will do it however you want to. Um, but this is the basic building block of 
Ansible automation is the task. It's the, the, the thing that Ansible actually does. Um, the next thing we have is a role. So, um, a role is an opinionated way and how to structure a set of playbooks. It's a folder structure for how things will go and what things belong where. So in Ansible, there's, you can include variables, you can include templates, you can include files, you can include additional metadata, you can include handlers. None of that stuff you see in here except for a template. Um, you can structure your code in a way that's readable and usable to other humans and they call that a role. And a role is a combination of tasks and variables to accomplish that task. Because the idea behind automation is that you want to make it as general purpose as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say I want to automate database installation. Instead of being specific and saying I want to automate MySQL installation, why don't I just automate database installation? And then write individual tasks for one for MySQL, one for Postgres, one for Redis, one for Mongo, one for Oracle. I mean, like, what, you're automating a database installation, so write the playbook once, and then make it work for all of those things. So somebody could just pick, like, hey, I want to install the Oracle database on this server and the Postgres one on this server, um, if that makes sense. So that's the, the idea of what a role is. And there's actually some examples. So. If you go to github.com slash ansible slash ansible dash examples slash tree slash master slash lamp simple with the L7 roles. That was uh, <laughs> a really long URL. Uh, if you just Google ansible examples, um, it'll bring you to this directory where this role is actually at so you can kind of see how it's structured. Then yeah, maybe it'd be valuable to just open that up. Um, so we can kind of version of 2.7, right? Um, the, the version of Ansible is specific to what you're trying to do. So Ansible does have many versions. Okay. Um, and most people just work with latest, like whatever the latest Ansible is. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll put this over on the screen here so you can see. Um, this is the Ansible example site, and these are all roles. So a role is automating something from start to finish. Uh, so we have like LAMP stack for, for HA proxy. This is the one that I used, LAMP simple rel 7. Um, and inside my role, like as, a, as I was saying, there are, um, there's a common role that applies to both uh, database servers and web servers. And then there's a DB role uh, and a web role so and, DB and web include common when they need common? Um, that depends on how it's structured. And if we go look here uh, in our site.yaml, which we're going to actually, that's actually my next slide. Um, let me go back over there. Roll over mouse. So the play or the playbook <clears throat> um, runs a role or many roles. So in this case, um, it's going to apply the common configuration to all hosts. So the playbook itself is, is specified by having um, targets for like who is this going to get applied against. And that's different from a task because a task, you can define who it's going to get, a, get uh, uh, applied against, but you really want to kind of do that in your playbook, which defines like if, I, if I'm going to uh, provision a database on a server, how do I know which server is which? I maintain that in an, in an inventory. Um, and I give those names. So like this one is gonna apply to all. So the common role will get applied to all hosts. And then the web server's role will get applied to the web, just the web server hosts that are specified in your inventory. And then obviously database is applied to DB servers. Any questions on that? It's pretty simple. Is the format of this all, um, why, uh, why YAML? Yeah. Yes, yet another markup language. Yeah, Ansible is all written in YAML. Um, that's the interpretive language, so it's, it's a really easy to understand syntax. And there's also plenty of editors out there, like uh, Visual Studio Code that has YAML, GitHub. Uh, Ansible-ish, so mm -hmm. kind of do code completion for Ansible. Right. That's kind of cool. 
I mean, there's a ton of tools. There's, a, there's more, ec more of an ecosystem being built around this. And like, if you compare Ansible against Bash, because like, I, don't, I, I don't need Bash on a system to run Ansible against it. It's done in Python. It uh, copies a Python module over, executes the action, unless my action depends on Bash. Um, but really, if you think about where this is going, is it's going to be much easier to administer systems. And, and it, it's available today too. It's just like people just haven't went through the work yet and done the things. Um, I know I want to say Red Hat's in, in progress of making system roles right now. Rich, are you familiar with any of that? So they've got this system roles that that will automate like network setup on your systems, one system, all systems, um, things of that nature. So that's kind of how Ansible structures. So, so, so what exactly is this doing? Like, How's it, when you say roles common, what, what's, it, what's that mean, like what's happening? Like, yeah, what is happening inside, well, it's the, the common role is, is completing a bunch of tasks. Okay, so it's just gonna, when you say roles, colon, and you say common, it's just gonna do stuff right there. It's gonna, yeah, okay. let's go look. That's, that's a good question, Rich. I know you're asking those questions for a reason. <laughs> uh, let's go into the role, and we'll go look, and we'll go, and I'll show you what the common role is doing. So uh, I wanna go into tasks, um, so what this thing's going to do on all servers is it's going to, and so all servers need MTB, all servers need lib, se, Linux, Python, uh, firewall D, it copies over an MTP configuration and then makes sure the service is started and enabled. So in the playbook saying roles common, we'll then look for that directory structure and run the every task that's... Yes. Yeah, so in this case, common... It's just a, um, a directory that includes different actions that will follow in yes. a particular order. Yeah. order. Yeah, so Ansible is, the, the Ansible code is structured around the, the, the folder structure for role. The Ansible role is an opinionated way to put together the folders. Because mm -hmm. like, they're just a bunch of flat text files. Like, how do I organize this craziness? They organize the craziness into what they call a role. And that's just a folder structure for where things will go, where variables and, and, will go. And I, where. Guess, I guess where there's some like friction, like understanding this is like yeah. role. I would typically consider like authentication authorization, but that's not what. This no, is. no, yeah, yeah. They could have done a better job with like yeah, yeah, yeah. picking more literally like any other name for it. That's all wrong. They could have picked any other name for that. It's uh, super confusing. But role is just a. It's just a folder structure. You don't have to use Ansible roles. It's in your best interest to do so because Ansible can kind of take advantage of some of the things, um, the way the directories are laid out. It's going to look in those directories. So when I say roles, it's going to look for a roles directory. And inside the roles directory, if I'm looking for the common role, it's going to look for a folder named common. And that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's just what I wonder. Yeah. So, so in the playbook, just that one line, roles common, does all this stuff. Yes. It does, it's going to do all this stuff. So, and these are just, these, these things here are just tasks. And how do I know that these are tasks? They're in the task folder. <laughs> they're in the, that's quite literally the reason why it, it, knows, it knows to recognize them. It's fast because so they're what are in the, the other, What are the other folders available? So, um, there's, well, there's a ton of, there's a, a ton of folders and this specific and one. under common, what are the other folders besides tasks? Yeah, there's yeah. handlers and templates. So, we'll, we can go touch on a template real quick. Um, so this template is variableized, so I can use a variable for MTP server, so I can change that. I don't have to go into the role itself. I can just declare that variable up front, and it will throw that all the way down here, because it's just a, it's just a Python variable. So this is the MTP configuration file that will get copied over, and this little bracket, this, this bracket thing right here, this is how you say that I want a variable, and then you declare that variable in your playbook when you run it. Um, and it will put that configuration, when it copies the template over it, will fill that variable in for you. It's pretty sick. There are parentheses and templates, which is the only place in Ansible that parentheses aren't required around variables. It complains other places. Um, that's, that's not consistent. If you put parentheses in here, I believe it will put parentheses in the, in the template when it gets copied in, so huh. just keep, keep, keep that kind of stuff in mind. So this is lists like variable name, value, variable yeah. name, values, that's all, that's all it's doing. Yeah. That's all it's doing. It's filling out the, so we'll go into like the web server. 
Um, this one only has tasks and templates. Like you can see they're, they're different. They don't have to include all of the folders, but there's like six or seven folders. There's handlers, there's variables, there's metadata, there's tasks, there's templates, there's files. I think I'm missing one in there. Okay. Um, let me check this template out so you guys can kind of see. So this one here is a little more, con this template here is a little more complex. So in my template, this guy's doing a for loop um, for each host in the group database server. So it's going to look in the inventory and say, hey, inventory, um, which host, for each host in the group database servers, do these things down here. Um, and this is how complex you can get with your variables if you want to pull variables out of Ansible. Ansible does this thing called gather facts when it runs. So it will go to the server and um, collect a bunch of data from it. Can you use that as an equipment inventory? Yeah, you could use yeah. an Ansible inventory. It's not like a, I know what you're asking there, yeah. though. Um, it seems like it's doing that. I just wondering, can you, you use that data, you, those data for yeah. it? So, so this, is, this has PHP code with Ansible yeah. variable substitution. So what are the Ansible variables in here? Just everything in the double braces? or the Everything in the, double, everything in the braces. double braces. And then the for loop is this guy right here. This is, uh, this is all Jinja2 formatting. If you're familiar with Jinja2, it's, it, this is all Jinja2 stuff. So like these, these brackets here in the parentheses indicate a loop or uh, a function. So if you're, mm -hmm. familiar, if, you, if you're familiar with the Jinja2 specifications, then you can use that. You can use that anywhere inside of Ansible. Um, Does it support multi-threading? Does it support multi-threading? You don't really need that. You're just no. you're just copying over files and configuring things. It's not it's not used to like don't use Ansible to like rsync a directory. That's not a good idea. Use rsync to rsync a directory. Yeah. 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 It's just copying over templates and configuring things. So there's not really a reason for that. Um, is Python multi-threaded? Yeah, uh, but it goes. Um, Ansible does things very pointedly, line by line, because you do this and then you do that. That's how automation works. If you have to uh, provision, say, 100 servers, though, is it going to go one by one? Or is it going to... Uh, you can configure Ansible. You know, that's kind, of a, that's kind of an interesting topic to bring up because, like, if I was going to do 100 servers, I would use Ansible in pull mode. So that way, every server just executes the, the Ansible individually and locally itself. So it will run much, much, much faster that way. Um, you can use like AWX or Ansible Tower. <laughs> you can use. You can use. There's a couple of tools out there. Um, you're asking if I can automate more than one server at a time. Yeah, and I want to say in the CLI version of Ansible, I don't believe it does. I think it just goes yeah, server by it's server. It's I don't. You know, sequential. like it's going through your host file sequentially. It's I want to say that that's what it does. I don't know for sure because I thought you could put forks in there, in the in the Ansible configuration, and it would go yeah, for multiple. I mean, kind of there's to, no yeah. there's no sleep command or anything. Or... Oh, no, there is. There's a sleep module. Like you okay. can do all that. Yeah. Okay. So. Sorry, I'm just thinking. About it. Yeah, the Ansible is very powerful, and anything you can do in Batch, you can do in Ansible. You can but, just but, but if you're thinking like sleep because you're waiting for something to come up or something, there may be a more direct way to tell Ansible wait for this thing to be available. Yeah. yeah. So Ansible, like let's say that that um, before I provision my web server, let's say I want to make for my make sure my database is actually up, running, and functional. There's a module that will check port 3306 and say wait for 3306 to be listening before you go on to this next step because. I can't go provision my database, like I, I set the server up, install the packages, set up the service, configure the actual database server itself, and then I want populated with databases. Well, that's not super valuable um, if it doesn't wait for the database to come up before it starts, you know, trying to put data inside of it. Okay, to that point, you said that they have written a lot of playbooks, but that sounds to me more like a scripting that will be based on your scenario of what you need to accomplish. Yeah, automation is ge is just general purpose scripts, right? But but you don't have to do all the hard work. So like, how are you going to script interacting with the uh, AWS API? Are you going to use curl? That sounds terrible. <laughs> can you use curl? Yes, you absolutely can. Just use curl. You don't need Ansible. But that's because you hate yourself. That's why <laughs> you would do things that way. Just use the module. Yeah, there's this module. There might be like wait for available or something. And you yeah. use that. And you, you don't have to write all that code to check a port. And yeah, you don't system. need to write that code. There's a module called 
wait for. Okay. <laughs> it's an actual Antonella module that will just wait. Like if you can wait to wait to see if SSH is up before you try automating a server. So let's say my workflow is I'm gonna provision all these instances on OpenStack because I hate AWS. <laughs> Oh, what? Oh. I know. I was just thinking about that. I was just thinking about that. Actually, I know. Yes, it's not. I'm glad to see if you were listening. Yeah. Make sure you're not bad at the same time. Let's say that my workflow, my automation flow, is I need to provision a bunch of servers on AWS, and then on top of those servers, I'm going to put a bunch of services. So let's say I'm going to bring up a, a complex web application. Well, once I provision my servers, I might want to wait for them to be up before I actually start trying to like configure an application on top of them. There's a module that does that. There's uh, modules that do all of these standard system administration tasks, and like the logic has already been worked out for you. You just need to use the right modules at the right times. Um, and that, like I said, the index is just. It is ridiculous, and we'll, we will. Oh, I'll open the, the Ansible module index so you can see just how many modules are already available for you. So that way, uh, you kind of know where to look and what to do to get started in this journey of automation. And automation is I'm going to do this thing, and then I'm going to do this thing. Uh, and there's a reason, very pointed reason, why they did that because the other configuration management tools out there, like it would randomly order doing things because. Configuration management and automation are different. Like with configuration management, I need to manage the NTP configuration file and the SSHD configuration file and you know 13 other configuration files on the system. But does it really matter the order that they happen in, or should I just do them as fast as I possibly can? Well, that's a problem in automation. If you use a, if you use a system that's designed around that to do automation, then you're going to run into problems with that keeping things in order. I'm sure Puppet's figured that out by now. I just don't know how to do it because, well, I'd rather write stuff like this because I can understand it. Because I'm a human, not a robot. Not That's what a robot would say. Exactly. Oh my God, the test would say it. So, there's actually some tools out there to help you make Ansible even easier than it already is. Like it can't get much easier to adopt, but like you were asking about, uh, that was a very good question, and I was gonna get to that. Um, I was just gonna wait till this slide to do it. So Ansible Tower and AWX is the upstream project for it. What are you looking, where are you staring at that, Rich? Ansible Tower will allow you to like wrangle all this stuff in because who likes to go log into a command line um, manage all these things, connect to a bunch of Git repos. Like that sounds like that's a task that needs to be automated too. And this app will do all that crap for you. It will maintain your inventory. It will connect to all your source control for all your automation. So you might have many different projects going on at any one given point in time. Like I'm trying to automate databases. I'm trying to have automate application deployment. I'm trying to automate auto scaling my infrastructure. Um, who will do all those things and like manage and, and wrangle in that craziness because um, this code over time, just like any sort of old school batch script, it gets complex over time. It doesn't start that way, but it surely ends that way. Um, and using an app that is designed from the get-go to manage the craziness that is automation is definitely in your best interest. If you've got a commercial organization, I want to say this is not even that relatively cheap. If you're just using it at home, there's an open source project for it. Um, parking meter, I think. Oh, it's a two hour limit, so if you started before 10, you get it. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like that for a lot, it's already 11. Um, <laughs> okay. Check what parking. <laughs> Who doesn't love Ron Splunkin? It's because you hate yourself. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up a, a short demo, and I'm going to use Tower to do that demo because uh, I have it. So why not? I don't know how this is going to work because I'm not sure how fast my internet connectivity is here. 
So we're going to find out. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a host and then I'm going to deploy uh, an application on top of that host. The application that I picked was Garrett Source Control. So that was kind of cool. Um, and I'll show you, like, there's no... And it's going to deploy in a container. So, so this is going to, what this is going to allow me to do. That's a great question. So upstream is like the open source projects mm -hmm. where the community is contributing and they're changing rapidly. And then what so where innovation is done. Yeah, and then what, we, what, what Red Hat as a company does is we consider like our products that are based on those upstreams mm -hmm. to be like the enterprise stable version. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so whereas upstream might have like six months of support or, you know. Like support, that. that's hilarious. You're not going to get less support. Than a year, less than a year of help. You know, we'll do it for multiple years. So. Okay. I always hear upstream with Red Hat. Upstream communities are where innovation happens. It's where developers from different companies that have different interests. So, like, when everybody from when people from IBM and VMware and uh, Oracle are writing their Ansible modules, where, where are they going to do? They, if they do that in a vacuum, it's probably not going to turn out well. They collaborate in the community. Okay. If yeah. a vendor has a vested interest in making sure their thing works with Ansible Tower, then they can meet in that community, and that's why the open source development method works much better than closed source methods. Okay. It just does. Okay. Because it allows multiple vendors to collaborate together in a non-competitive environment. It's actually collaborative. But if you're a large enterprise, you may not have the resources or the time to continually chase the latest release in some right. community that's rapidly innovating. You might want to stay stable for a period of time and not break things that currently work. Yeah. If they're changing things. Okay. So that's why you would make that consideration. But it just depends. Like there's companies that they're good with that. You know, they're gonna go chase the latest and keep it up to date and they've got people that can do that. And, okay. Yeah, and it's really more about culture in a government's perspective. Do not do not deploy community code because they don't at their scale that any government agency is at, they just don't have the people and the manpower to maintain it. They just don't. If you're a small organization of ten people, you can grab some code out of the open source community, third in your organization, it'll be good. It'll probably be just fine. If you've got a talented group of individuals, but the government just it's, it's just too big. And I would I would even argue it depends on what you're doing. Like like Ansible Engine is fairly simple as an upstream project. Like you could probably stay current. That tower starts to get more complicated. If you're doing something like OpenStack and you want to chase the latest shiny, you're probably going to tear your hair out. Like you want some stability around. Unless it. you're really good. Unless you got really, really, really you got good. a really smart group of guys that are really 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 motivated to do that stuff. That's that's where open source. Okay. FOSS, free open source, can be valuable and useful. So in my little demo here, uh, the, the reason that I'm demoing Tower or AWX is because honestly it exists. Like why, why would you do it any other way? You write your automation code in source control and then the command line and you use the command line version and then put it into a, some, something that I can just schedule these jobs and make sure it's always running and make sure it always works. and. Um, one thing I didn't go through is item potency, which I, I guess I can show in my demo. So I just wanted to show you that there are no containers on, uh, there's no images and no containers on this host. And we're gonna see how well this works because uh, uh, I did not test this on my, my laptop, has its own 4G connection. Um, and I'm not gonna go through this whole web GUI. I'm gonna go through the, the things that are important. Um, so they have this uh, idea of projects, and a project is nothing more than like an Ansible thing that you're doing. It's a task that you're automating. So like, let's say the HR department goes through and does some reconciliation on records, and you're gonna use Ansible to automate that task. Well, you don't want that to exist in the same code repository where your infrastructure deployment stuff is at. You probably wanna keep those separate. A project in, inside of Ansible Tower or AWX is nothing more than a way to segment get repos. Okay. That's all it is. It's like simple. Um, you also have credentials. Like this is how I log into a box because Ansible is going to automatically log in for you. Copy the Python modules over with the appropriate variables, uh, variables and then execute it. Um, you got to have a way to log into a box. Credentials. Simple. Inventories. Inventories are a group of hosts. One host, many hosts that are um, 
organized chronologically or organized logically together. So in this inventory called demo inventory, if you remember before that, like on the playbook where it said hosts and it had all the web servers and database servers, this is where that information would be stored. It would look okay. for the inventory and in this case, in that playbook, I would have to write demo inventory. Um, I can put together groups of hosts. Um, I only have, I have no groups, I don't, I just have hosts in here. Um, and then templates. And the templates are a collection of jobs. So this is like the play that I'm gonna run. This is what I actually want to I say, I've got a project that's got this code in it. Um, let's go in and show you how that kind of works. So I've got a project with this code. Um, inventory, so here's my project. Uh, local actions, here's my inventory, demo inventory. Uh, I can even pick the type of job because I can test to see if an Ansible job is going to work before I actually run it. Um, it will act like it's going to run it and will do all the same things as if, as if it was going to run it, but then not actually do it. Uh, Ansible does have that mode. Um, I'm going to pick the playbook that I'm going to use. Remember, things are structured in the playbooks, and then roles, and then tasks. So like playbooks are a composition of one or many roles. Roles are a composition of one or many tasks. So what's the, what's the different job types that are there? Yeah. In here? Yeah. You want to check? Check mode will just let you run an Ansible module as if it was going to do it, but won't actually do it. Um, to answer your question over there about forks, that's, that's called forks in Ansible. So I want to run it against uh, parallel simultaneous processes when executing the okay. playbook. Excellent. And then how do I log into the box? Demo credential. Does cool. this fork slice up the host file or like the, the systems you're going against? How does it? How does it do it? I don't know. I'm not that deep into it. Oh. I know. I know. <laughs> it's <not. laughs> like if it just says, okay, we'll just split this up. In the I box. think it's just not, you know, if you have 50 hosts and you create 50 forks, it will do all 50 at the same time. Same time. Okay. And I think I want to say that's dependent on the host you're running Ansible from, because the way that it works is like it builds this Python module. SCPs it over to the box, executes the Python module, and then deletes it off. That's how it works. And it's relatively simple. Um, and you get a whole bunch of other options in here I don't really want to explain. Um, and, and then you have variables. Remember that, that time that I said you could put variables into a template or a task or, or a thing? I can put that variable here and make that easy to consume from my playbook so I don't have to worry about like storing. Let's say I wanted to store a password in my automation in one of my passwords in here. Um, Ansible has a, a way to manage and do those things and they come in as, as variables. Um, Tower adds on a couple of extra cool things like surveys, like let's say I'm gonna hand, I'm gonna write this automation, I'm gonna have an engineering department write this automation and then they're gonna hand it over to an idiot user. And that idiot user does not need to know how any of the automation works because I can just add a survey in here um, to ask this dude questions. <laughs> be like, look, I know that this is a really complex topic, but I'm gonna ask this person real human being questions. Put it in the survey, and the survey translates those things into variables. So I can put the variables in the playbook. Like, hey, you wanted to deploy this application. Where did you want to deploy it? I can ask a normal human question, but I don't need to cover that part in my actual automation. So engineers can be engineers, operators can be operators. Never the twain shall meet. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and execute this guy because uh, I have no idea how long it's going to take to run um, or if it's even going to work. I tested it on my home internet. So, what, it do? Uh, what this playbook does, and, and you're going to see in here, um, is it runs Hello World. Um, and that really just makes sure that it works. So this is my box. This is like my actual physical laptop that this is uh, run, executing these actions against. I can make this bigger. Can I make this bigger? No, that's not okay. Yeah, yeah, is it yeah, running off a couple of VMs? What's that? Is it running off a couple of VMs? No, one. One VM. One VM. It's running off one VM. And what it's doing right now, the next step that it's going to do is it's going to pull down a container image. And the container image that it's going to pull down um, is Garrett. I want to say that my, you know, my network connection is very slow, so this is going to be really super boring. Um, <laughs> while well, well, the container thing runs in the background. So uh, now that I kick that demo off, I guess I can go, uh, I can go take you through 
some of the other things you get at a tower. Um, you can also split things up um, into organizations. So like, let's say I have uh, a cloud engineering department and an infrastructure engineering department and I have a whole bunch of organizations inside of my top end shop and I want everybody to just automate all the things. I can logically split those people apart so it's multi-tenant. I guess is the best way to describe that that part of the feature. So, for DoD's perspective or VA's perspective, the VA could have one tower, and then each individual shop inside of the VA would be an organization inside of the tower, um, and that allows people to logically separate but use the same resource. So you can share resources and save money, uh, save time. So like you only have to maintain one or two instances of tower, and you can automate all the things. Um, you can also break people up into users and teams. So individual users belong to teams, teams belong to organizations. So that way, uh, when people log in, they see the automation they have access to and can run and execute the automation they have access to. It's like, I don't want somebody from my operations department touching my engineering playbooks to do things for any reason ever, right? So that makes sense. It may not make sense for that. So, um, the inventories in here, uh, uh, Ansible has this capacity to do dynamic inventory. So if you already have a CMDB, I think that's, that was the word I was looking for earlier, CMDB, um, that has a list of all the servers or all the services inside of your environment, um, uh, Ansible can actually talk to those things. So like Foreman, um, if you provision all your servers, like I provision all my servers with Foreman at the moment. I, I, I was using Ironic, now I use Foreman. Now that you brought up CMDB, you could use, sounds like you could use Ansible to sort of verify or document as well as implement configuration management board decisions. You could. Yeah, you can use it. Ansible is general purpose automation. I mean, the answer is, can I do that with Ansible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can do literally anything with Ansible. Is there a module already written for it? Probably for the thing that I want to do. And I can connect to an existing um, inventory source. So that way, here, I actually... And you've complied with a lot of NIST controls that way if you implement it right. Yeah. What is the biggest pull for other things like big folks? Or SCCM over Ansible. Huh? Why would I use Ansible? Because I don't hate myself, man. Oh, no. <laughs> he, was, he was asking, how does it compare to like Microsoft Scum or Big Fix? They're not comparable. They do different things. Ansible's general purpose automation, and it's easy to read. So how it compares is those are in the those are in the puppet chef. Oh. Too okay. complex yeah, for yeah, any engineer yeah, yeah. to anybody who's not a computer scientist to understand. Like, I don't know if Scum includes like you want to configure your boat case switches or your Cisco switches or all that. That's all in Ansible module. So when you have Ansible, if those things are listed on port twenty two, mm -hmm. the thing that in the module, yeah. you, you can actually configure your entire data center, not just your servers or processes. Yeah, this is not just for applications. It'll do network devices. I guess this is a good time to go check out the module index okay. because I can show you like. These are all the. These aren't all the modules. These are the groups of modules and that are available. Is, it's not just somebody wrote these. Cisco contributed their network modules. Brocade yeah, we'll go, their we'll network go look in the network modules, modules just because. A, there's A10, ACI, Cisco ACI. Can you do a control F for Juniper? Juniper? Yeah. There you want to control? You want to control the banner? Command? Config? Fax? L3 interface? LDP? Yeah. <laughs> It is, it, this is the question I asked earlier. Is yeah. Part of the challenge is just knowing what modules are out there versus going oh. oh, I mean, there's just, yeah. right over here is a list of, this is just, net, like over here on the left, this is just network vendors. That's just network vendors. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. <laughs> like, look how many there are in here. Has somebody went through this stuff, done these things for, uh, Puppet has a pretty good ecosystem. I want Puppet Forge. But that's that's still pretty significant community support right there. Well, this is not, these are vendors that are right. writing. No, I see that. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. not, I mean, so, it's. So some of the servers yeah. that are out there, like Supermicro or something, do they have like a default admin port that the, the BIOS is listening on or anything? IPMI? Yeah, IPMI, yeah. 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 And that should be on there too. Um, right here's the remote, right, right here. IPMI. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you were asking about IPMI, it's right there. Um, HP ILO, right there. 
If you've got, uh, I don't think, uh, you, so UCS, I don't I don't see uh, Dell's Drac in here. It might be somewhere else, though. So it's just because not the, there doesn't mean it's just not. Just with a bare metal flipped on server, you can contact it and do stuff. As long as you have a way to turn a thing on, you surely could. Yeah. Um, let's say I have a workflow that turns my server on, configures a Pixie server to put a particular operating system together, um, ready for this, this thing that I just flipped on to be provisioned. And the configure the Pixie server, when the server turns on, um, it runs through Pixie Boots, you know, does that whole kickstart based installation. Um, once it's done, I can turn it back off with IPMI and deconfigure that Pixie server to prepare for the next system to come online. What mm -hmm. is the Pixie boot? Pixie booting is it a is it an Ansible agent? Does Ansible oh use Pixie agent? booting is used for like kickstarts and automated system installation. That's like something baked into. Yeah. No, I know what it is. I'm just saying, how does it integrate with this? I mean, what's it what's its role within the Ansible so e ecosystem? What's Pixie operates, booting? Is all of, are all of your nodes Pixie booting? So, honestly, with with the way that I do things is I separate system provisioning from automation. So I can use Ansible to tell Foreman, provision this guy this way. Um, I would not use Ansible to do operating system installation. There are better tools for that. Okay, that's so, what I just kind of heard yeah, that. I wanted to clarify that. Yes, that's so good. So Pixie, but if I have like a bare metal super micro never been installed, nothing, it just mm -hmm. has the management interface. If I turn that on, mm -hmm. it's going to just go into like a BIOS looking for network boot stuff. It's just not going to do anything. It's just going to sit there and wait, basically. You know, keep cycling through that if you tell it to. Yeah. You gotta tell it. You gotta go in the BIOS and tell it to, to retry. It's called retry boot in most most BIOSes, but it will continuously retry to look for DHCP. And it'll just be advertising it's available, and then somebody. It won't it. advertise that it's available. It's looking for DHCP. Okay. And then if it gets a DHCP IP address, you can put parameters inside of DHCP that say, go it. yeah, go over to this TFTP server and grab these images and boot this kernel this way. You can provide those parameters inside of. Uh, DHCP so it just comes say, up for DHCP, basically. It, yeah, that's it. Yes, that's what it is. That with yeah. And like Foreman does all that stuff for you. Like the combination between Foreman and Ansible Tower or AWX is just it was fantastic. And Foreman is like, the upstream for Red Hat so. Satellite, yeah. So Satellite used to be Spacewalk, now it's Foreman. Um, oh, okay. I've heard of Spacewalk. Yeah, it's Spacewalk Satellite 5. Okay. Um, and this makes your life just like so much easier because not only do I not have to provision metal because I can automate that part with the kickstart, um, I can keep my kickstarts really simple because really all I need is just an, an OS. And then I use my Ansible automation to configure that operating system. That's right, you don't have to give it like this Anaconda thing that goes No, through. and you know, I keep my Anaconda from install. breaking. It can all just be in an Ansible playbook. And you're, you're almost going around the Anaconda well, step. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the, also what this, so yeah. what this provides you, or the opportunity that provides you, is if you think about it like this, that what if the server that I'm trying to automate exists outside of my organization, maybe it exists in the cloud and I just got an image. So instead of putting all the automation in the Kickstart, I put all the automation in the Ansible because all I really want is a is a, just a base OS, and, and you've I'll got more control of it that way too. Yeah, I've got more control of it that way, um, and and the bare metal exists. I pixie boot that on my network, but if I go to DigitalOcean and provision an operating system, well, they already did the pixie boot part for me. Like that already happened. So if I put my automation in the pixie boot section, then I've kind of diminished the value in automation because. I can only point it at just my local infrastructure. So with your Pixie Boot stuff, just put a base operating system down and then use general purpose automation to take it up the rest of the way. It's really so can, can we integrate this Ansible tower into the DevOps pipeline? Yeah, it, you could use it to manage and maintain your DevOps pipeline. So if you wanted it to say, pull down a Docker container, execute some actions, turn the container off, delete the image, move the image over to a different repo, I'd be willing to bet there are Ansible modules for Docker. Uh, I'm to say they're in cloud modules. I can't remember though. There was a tab about working with with um, VMware. You guys get a chance. Where? How is? How is? What's you guys take on how it works with uh, We Realize? Nobody uses We Realize. <laughs> Only people who hate themselves. <laughs> it's terrible. I'm not, I'm this is a self love session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, really, yeah. like, do people actually use that? Why? I haven't seen it. It's the purpose in, the, if you're going to spend the time to write V Realize and automation, then you just siloed yourself into VMware. 
you just stuck yourself there because now I think not that, only that's is it, the important point, right? Like you don't want to be pigeonholed with one vendor's technology. This no. is this is why like cloud portability is such a big thing, and this is why things like Jenkins files for DevSecOps as well as Ansible for DevSecOps. You can automate the open nest cap scans. You can do a lot of stuff to generate ATO sort of artifacts that you need, but do it in a way that you're not locked to one vendor. You know? Right, and I'm the not. More, I'm and I'm not. I'm not going to slam on anybody. Like Azure has a great set of services you can use. AWS has a great set of services you can use. The more you plug yourself into that, the more you're you're there, and it's hard to lift and go to somewhere else. Right, you're trying. And one to, of the examples I love to use is like DreamWorks or Pixar. One of those, or maybe both. They're constantly pricing out who has the cheapest compute resources because rendering movies is really expensive. So when they got to build scenes, they have software that's like, all right, this cloud provider's the cheapest right now because it's like 3 a.m. in the morning. Let's send the workload yeah. there and start generating those Smart. those images. Smart. Or, Smart. You know, or, or, or Amazon's cheapest right now. We're going to send it there. Or, you know, Azure's cheapest right now. We're going to send it there. So they just, they're constantly doing that. They're, they're not tied to any one provider. They don't care. Right. They just want. They just need a CPU. They just need cycles and RAM. And that's the idea. To some extent, uh, we, we use that for uh, you know for cloud agnostic. Uh, you know, uh, Terraform I, from HashiCorp. Yeah. yeah. And Terraform's great too. I mean, and Terraform I believe has Ansible Ansible backend, but you're kind of stuck. I mean, with a, with any sort of automation, you're stuck with the automation that you wrote. Like you're kind of already stuck there. Right, right. You know, and that's fine too. Terraform is another good one to bring up. Um, because it is general purpose automation and it's not configuration management I mean, and you got to have to like define the difference in between the two. Yeah, we use PowerShell DLC and uh, for uh, DevOps problem we use this Ansible configuration server which where we, uh, it contains these playbooks mm -hmm. and uh, that configuration server has SSH access to all the target nodes and mm -hmm. through this release pipeline we try to deploy that, you know, run the playbooks. Why do you use Tower? <laughs> it yeah, sounds like you built a tower. I mean, like that's that's quite literally yeah, what tower does. Yeah, it's a web interface, and uh, it's more like an interface wide thing. So we're just working on one and one. So. Hey, check it out! My demo actually worked. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> that's super exciting. It did that over those four G connections. So, um, if you remember before, my there was no container images in here, and there was no running application, and now I have I have this. Uh, can you show us the Ansible job output? Like when it I, I, yes, I'm going to show you that my app actually works first. I, I remember Ted saying, uh, well, I think he went to, to DISA and, and they were like, where's my app? I need to see the app. Like, you showed me all these cool things, but there's no app. Got to show you the app. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> there's your hello world. Yeah. <laughs> Garrett. I actually installed Garrett. Oh, um, Garrett's pretty slick too. It's like if you don't want to use GitHub, you can use Garrett, Gogs, you know, all these types of things. And I go to my job, and I did get a job status back. Um, you see, I didn't have to sit here and like stare at the job screen while it's running. It just runs. Like, you schedule this job and then walk away. Um, so I go here and check it out. So what I did was I uh, pulled the Garrett image, and then I created a container. I used the Docker module to do that. So. Um, I use the image module and the container module, so I manage my image and I manage my container. Using, uh, if you go container. back to that job screen for a sec, or, sure. or where it was run. So the other thing too is you'll see there's a changed, and sometimes there's nothing that was changed. So basically Ansible is sort of a desired state, current state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you're, you're talking about item potency right now, and I guess I can hit on that. Because item it's potency. do not repeat yourself. And, and well, I'm gonna, I was going to run yeah. it again. Um, to cover the item potency part. So item potency and automation, and this is another thing that makes automation different from, uh, from scripting. So what you've heard so far today is, is pretty much like, well, why can't I just do this in Bash? Or why can't I just do this in PowerShell? Or why can't I use the scripting language that I've already built all this stuff in? And item potency is why. Handling item potency inside of a shell script whether that's PowerShell or Batch, is not fun. Um, and item potency is the ability to run things again. Like, let's say I do a database deployment, set up my database. What happens if I run that shell script again? What's it gonna do? And handling what it's gonna do is where you'll spend all of your time. If you're gonna, if you're gonna automate things in some sort of scripting language, or in Python or in Ruby or in some programming language, 
you're going to spend all your time trying to handle the, I already did that. How do I just skip past it and move on to the next? Or how do I check and make sure it is the way that I said that it should be? And Ansible will do those things for you. If something is already in the state that you want it to be in, it will not do anything. It'll just move on to the next step. It'll tell you, they're like, hey, I checked that. It's good to go. Yeah, so it already had the image. So if I go in here and check, see the reason that this is uh, uh, the reason this is green is because it was already there. It didn't change. Um, and if something's not changed, then it just says, "Okay, I did that. It was already like it was already like." Yeah, the, other, the other thing you'll see is skip. Yeah. It doesn't have to do it because it doesn't apply. Yeah. So basically, you know, you try to do that with a bash script, like you want to append configuration to some file, you got to check, is that already in that file? If not, right. then write that section. If, you know, so, right. so you got to do all this, like, complex logic. This just... It handles it for you, and that's part of, like, being idempotent, and Ansible strives to do that with all of the modules that encourage the community, like, hey, if you're going to contribute a module, write in the logic so I can run this more than once so the users don't have to do that. Are all not? I don't want to say a hundred percent of the modules right now, like the community modules specifically, are item potent. But all the supported modules that like people are shipping, they're all item potent. So they won't do the same thing again, especially if it's damaging. Can you configure Ansible to uh, set the frequency that it checks for configuration drift on its nodes? So it's not a configuration manager. Ansible's not like that. It's not schedulable. Like not just issue, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it doesn't run an agent. It's it's cold, it's, it's, it's okay, yeah. totally That's agentless. So Ansible pushes in. You can run it in pull mode, but it's there's no like daemon or or process that's running aside from automation code is executing right now. That's it. Um, but you can use Tower to do things like that. You can schedule jobs. So is Tower sort of like a manager of Ansible processes? Yeah, or, it's like you know? a it's like a, a schedule. So it's a, it's right there it is. So I can run this. So, I can okay. run this job on a schedule. I can just tell it like, hey, once a day, check all these things. Is it, is it like cron file? Or is it you can just use cron if you want to just use cron. Um, but why? Just use Tower. No, I mean it's already been done for you. The whole purpose is keeping the barrier to entry as low as humanly possible, and like if you're searching not for doing conditions in your servers, like you're searching for you know, if you're concerned about drift, maybe this is not like what, what you could do with this is say every 24 hours bring machines back into alignment, but that's not necessarily detecting. You know, if, like, like if you wanted to combine platforms <coughs> with Ansible, you could do that. And I would just use Puppet for something like that because yeah. Puppet will change like right now. And the puppet agent like downloads the configuration file, so if somebody goes in and changes it, right. even if even if puppet's not it. connected, it will still change it back. Like it doesn't need to check in to change things back. Like it will just do it. Um, but puppet, puppet has an agent on each of its. Yeah, yeah. and but that but doesn't work for a router or switch. So it's funny if you're scanning for like CV vulnerabilities, where CVs are coming from different sources. And yeah. yeah, that might be something Cloudforms is better at, and then Cloudforms could launch a module to bring everything up to date based on affected right. systems. Or and if you know that, like, there's, let's say, you 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 know for sure that Puppet needs to pull down its latest configuration change, like you want to trigger all the agents, but if you have a thousand nodes, that would be really painful to SSH into or write a bash script to do all that for you. So you could use Ansible to trigger the Puppet agent on all of those systems. Be like, hey, I just put out a new Puppet module, a new version of that module, and I want them to pull the latest one right now. I don't want to wait 30 minutes. You could use Ansible. If for some weird re reason you ever wanted to have it's Ansible easy. and Puppet coexist together, you yeah. just described a situation for that. They're actually very complementary. They're not competing technologies at all because Ansible's general purpose automation, Puppet is configuration management, and they are both very good at those tasks. Um, Deploy both with the strengths of each. Yeah, yeah. Use use yeah. the right tool right. for the job. Don't you know? Don't use an adjustable wrench. Get a get a ten millimeter wrench when you need a ten millimeter. Get a thirteen millimeter wrench when you need a thirteen millimeter. Don't get the wrong tool. Use the right tool for the job. Um, and it's not great. Ansible is not great at configuration management. Puppet's great at configuration management. So, yeah. Any more questions I can answer? It's about all. I mean, there's a, we could talk about this for days and days. You can talk about automation for days and days and days and go really deep into this topic. Um, 
hopefully this you know presentation has been enough to convince you to at least go check it out. You were um, talking about some of the, you know, there's not a lot of complex logic in Ansible tasks and playbooks and, and such and roles, yeah. but the complex logic must be in the Python code that's driving it underneath. Yeah, yeah, let's go look at like a... Um, what is the, uh, how does it convert the, uh, the different types of stuff? How does it convert the, the, uh, the Yami to Python? So that's what the module does. That's called a module inside of inside of Ansible. Um, Which module? So this like this this module here, I'm gonna pick on OS object, OpenStack object. It's just this is a Python module that yeah. somebody wrote, yeah. um, and the logic is handled by the individual module, where they give you an example of how to operate the module, but the actual um, code that is used that is applied against your system is written as an Ansible module. So depending on what you write in your task roles and playbooks, it calls particular modules yes. to execute what you've scripted. Yes, these are all, that, that, then that's where we looked at the, we've been looking at the module index. Um, the module index has all the pre-written Python modules, like these are all the things that have already been automated for you. Keystone service, so you're talking OpenStack as yeah, well. Yeah, this, this is all OpenStack, yeah. I mean oh, yeah. this is all the cloud stuff, I mean here's, here's Google, here's CloudStack, here's Azure, Azure's got a lot, um, here's Amazon, look at all these Amazon modules, look at all these Amazon, look at all these EC2 modules. Patrick is happy. I know, look, look at this, look at all this stuff. If you don't want to learn Amazon's APIs, and at this point, why would you? Just use Ansible. <laughs> they already learned them for you. And you can execute them more than once. So you know, I presume the that, that the people upstream Ansible would be updating their interface if, as Amazon updated their APIs, and that would be true for all the other systems it's interfacing with. Yeah. One would think. Yeah, yeah one would think. Yeah, I would assume that, uh, that it would be in Amazon's best interest to ensure their Ansible modules work very well with their cloud. And I bet it's at Google's interest to make sure that the Google model all works extremely yeah. well with yeah. their cloud. It's not it's not in your interest, the automator. All of those if you want somebody to, to use your it, product yeah. or service, then maybe you should write a module and keep it up to date. Otherwise people are gonna be like, Well, your product's junk, I can't even automate it. <laughs> so they basically would push it to the upstream of Ansible. Yeah. To Yeah. And you know, those modules are all they're all written in Python. You can also write your own modules. So if there is something on here that's not already automated, you can, Ansible can also consume custom written modules that you've built yourself. Like let's say there's a, uh, you want to do some craziness in, in Red Hat Satellite that's not there today, or something in OpenStack that's not there today. You could just write the Python module yourself. Yeah, I bet there would be even some example code in how to do it. But that, it has to be Python? It has to be Python, okay. yeah, it uses Python. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, you could, you could use a, and there was there was something like Ansible. It was Python two for a while. Have they converted the? Python? I don't think they're uh, hundred percent converted to Python three. They're not anybody not. is. They're not. No. So so that was like one of the original versions was written in Python two. A lot of stuff was written. There's in nothing Python wrong with 2. Python two. Like it's not like it's out of service yet. It, it, it's not. But, but that's where you sometimes run into friction. It's like what Python do you have installed on your system? Make sure you have both available. You know. So. You can call. You can tell uh, Ansible which interpreter to use. So you can tell you have Python 2 or Python 3. It's got, it's got that built in. And then one of the things I ran into, so the OpenShift installer for OpenShift 3 mm -hmm. has a crap ton of <laughs> settings in its inventory file. Bajillions of settings. So, so, so what they did with OpenShift, and this is like probably like a not a good use case of Ansible, or where Ansible was a great idea and then it went kind of off the rails a little bit. Not only are there like a ton of variables, but how you set variables can cascade into how other variables are set. So right. when the playbooks run, you're going to get errors that this variable is not the correct setting, but that may not be the variable that was in your inventory file. You have to find <laughs> the thing in your inventory that through some other playbook cascaded into the settings that, you know, and it's just, it's challenging. <laughs> it is challenging, and there. So, so, so it's just it's just a, it's such a big set of settings. It's almost like pre data validation, you know, before you go into it. Well, I mean, yeah. if you think about like so, some of these like, technologies I, I, that are out there are really point point complex. Point. Like Ceph's complex, and yeah. or uh, OpenShift is complex, and they wrote Ansible playbooks to make it easier to like get that technology. But you have to get those settings right when you're installing it, or you just get weird. So, so that's why they're moving to operators. So they're going to have just intelligent installation. Like there's not going to be any of this crazy 
set up 250 parameters. To write so they say that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we'll, that, we'll see how that works. Well, they make it easy because people don't yeah, hate they, themselves. Well, right? They, they, <laughs> right? They're supposed to make it easy so people can hate themselves less. <laughs> um, but here's an example of, of full scope automation, um, and this actually installs Ceph. So, if anybody's familiar with software defined storage, Ceph. These are all the roles that are available to you inside of Ceph. So, like, let's say we want to look at this. Like, how do we set up a Ceph monitor? Um, these are the tasks. You can that, manage your storage with Ansible too. Right? You could man. You could manage the setup and installation. This is this is just like setup. So this is the code that you that they use to set up Ceph and like get it running. So, so can you go back one step here? Like these, these are all the yeah, these yeah. tasks are actually comprised of other tasks. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you hit the back that's button. That's what you were getting at with the uh, nesting, more or less. Of it. I don't know. If, if yeah. you had just, just back. I, I'll, I'll go back for just a second. Give me one second. So I want to cover this this thing. <laughs> so right in, in this task, um, I'm setting a parameter called when. So I'm going to run this task when a variable is called containerized deployment. Right? Um, and Ansible, you can set the state of when you want things to happen based on other conditions. So you don't have to be serial in how you write your playbooks. They can right. just keep it very You can say um, install or, you know, or provision application when, a, or reprovision application when API stops. So, function. so when Ansible runs this role, mm -hmm. it's going to immediately go to the main YAML file. Is that what it does by default? And then, it, and then those other ones that are in there get pulled in by main? Is yeah. It, okay. Yeah, that's why that's all the in main. There's all these includes. It almost seems like an event trigger of sorts. Yeah, sort of like that. Yeah, yeah. And you can think about think of it however you want to, because um, the general purpose automation is is entirely up to you. Uh, it is entirely up to the person writing the automation and how they want to do it. Like this guy here. Um, this is this is pretty complex shell script that it's running. It's running running Python to generate a key. Um, for Seth. As soon as I set Rome once, um, I can I can do all the, these are this is what a, a real playbook actually looks like. So like does a real this is a very real playbook does a very real thing. I just used it yesterday. A sprinkling of code comments in there. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean they have they document so in the name of each playbook, and this is like kind of like you know how in Python they expect you to be Pythonic. They expect you to comply with certain standards when you're writing the code in Ansible, they expect you to give everything that you're doing a name. So at least I can kind of tell, like, I have no idea what this is doing because all of the things are variableized. But at least my name says, uh, uh, what I'm gonna do is create a Ceph monitor or use a makefs without a keyring. I can kind of tell um, what's happening in the playbook because somebody wrote it down. Super helpful. All right. Well, that's pretty much all I got. Any questions? Any other questions on Ansible that could be useful at answering? <laughs> Good thinking. End of presentation. <laughs> <laughs>